me. Um, I know it's very late, and I actually have prepared something that is quite different from what I, you know, well, than what we've heard so far. I took the word school seriously, and I sort of did something that is more aimed to advanced student, young uh, researchers. So, you know, I'll try to either skip things that everybody here knows or just drop them all together. Uh, so that was one apology. The second apology, what? Okay. The second apology is that this summer school is about literary genres, and I am actually going to speak about documentary genres. And in fact, I'm going to speak about something that is not a genre at all, which is women's letters. You know, there are different genres of letters. You know, there's letters of condolence, there's petitions, there is uh, recommendations. Women's letters are not a genre in and of itself. They're just generally within uh, letters. Yet, I am going to ask, uh, first of all, uh, is there something that, well, that's actually the last part of the talk. Is there something that we can say that distinguishes uh, women's letters? And the other thing is uh, to talk about, and I'll explain, you know, you know, what are women's letters? Are, we, are these really women's letters? Are we hearing women's voices? And all that sort of thorny question. Um, I feel like this is very loud. Is that? It's not. It's not? Okay. I just in my ears. Okay. Um, and my last apology is that this is a work... Okay. Also, how long should I speak? Well, I... We should, uh, we should go to this uh, reception for us. Let's say at a quarter seven. Okay. So the first thing I'll say is, if you have a question, ask it. You know, instead of putting it to the end and me talking and talking, just ask the question. If it interrupts me too much, I'll just say I'll answer it in a while. Okay, so we can have it as a conversation. Okay. Okay. Um, so my last apology is that this is a work in progress, and I'm also apologizing for this apologizing because I hate it when people say this is a work in progress. I mean, if you have something to say, say it. Don't hide or try to already sort of withdraw to the sort of, this is a work in progress. But this is a work in progress uh, because when Guy uh, asked me um, to talk about, uh, what was it, uh, at least uh, about a genre in at least two religious cultural communities from all around the Mediterranean, I thought, okay, I work on the Cairo Geniza letters, mostly letters to do with the family, married life, and so forth. What other sort of religious community I will look like. And I said, okay, this is an occasion for me to, okay, this is not completely foreign territory for me, but to look at the papyri, Arabic papyri, uh, more thoroughly than I've done before. Um, so, of course, you cannot, you know, start reading Arabic papyri and within a few weeks, uh, you know, be uh, a specialist. I'm not, I'm not claiming to. And that's why this is a work in progress. This is sort of me using this occasion for a bit of an experiment if you want, sort of trying to, you know, and one of the questions that, you know, I thought I will develop with you or at least discuss with you is, you know, you talked about comparison. I mean, what is what I'm doing, uh, 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 you know, are these two corpora complementary? Should we use them as for a comparison? And I'm not even sure what is at stake by talking about complementary versus contradictory. It's something that I'm not yet fully, I'm, I'm not really aware what is it that is at stake for me, but they're, they're obviously very useful um, together. I'm just not sure exactly how I want to use it. Okay, so now that I'm done with the apology, I'll explain why I chose this topic. Basically, as I said, my work is usually on married life, um, women in court, um, and so forth. Uh, but whenever, I, and I use a variety of genres in my work, uh, letters, uh, court documents, uh, sometimes when I can, literary sources. But whenever I, I uh, talk, I present a paper on anything that mentions a woman letter, within two minutes, the discussion derails completely, and René here can be a witness, so at least one case that it, it happened, to this sort of question, you know, are these really women's letters? Uh, are we really hearing their voices? and so forth. So I thought to use this occasion to kind of think through the problem. And if you say that you don't think it's problematic, I can switch to the end. Uh, but I'll start raising the question. And if I, I don't really, well, you'll see. OK. So like all good things, uh, my talk today will be divided into three parts. The first part, and I'll do it as quickly as I can, is to talk about the two corpora. And I don't want to just you know, tell you what is 
Vaginiza, which you all know, and what is Arabic papyri, which is a bit less uh, well known, but to also talk about the fields and the history of the two fields, I think, tell us also something about the corpora. Um, the next part, we'll discuss again this issue of women's letters and what is it that we expect, because a lot of it is to do with, I think, expectations. And the last part, we'll talk, we'll suggest me suggesting one element which I think does distinguish women's letters. Um, if we get there, hallelujah. Questions? Okay, I haven't said anything. Okay, so, okay, I prepared this whole sort of Arabic uh, papyri comparison. Maybe everybody here knows it. Um, so I'll do it basically as quickly as I can. And these are broad generalizations, but I do actually am a great believer in broad generalizations. I, help, I find them, they help me think. So bear with me. So the first thing I need to clarify is that when we speak about papyri, uh, you know, I mean the text studied by papyrology, which, has, which is not necessarily papyrus, you know, the, the, the plant, but also a whole range of mediums, paper, f uh, parchment, f fabric, ostraca, bones, palm leaves, wooden boards, uh, though I think inscriptions are usually excluded. Uh, there is different debate, and this is actually is important, about how to define papyrology. And I think that you know, the usual sort of definition, the one that we can work with, is that it deals with text not preserved uh, through traditional channels of manuscript preservation. And I think that's important. So you know, usually texts found in archaeological digs, il you know, illegal digs, or those discovered by chance. Do we know a corpus of documents discovered by chance? Um, and OK, so the most f famous uh, place for finding papyri is Egypt, but of course there are in Khorasan, Syria, uh, Palestine, and so forth. Um, and this is important, papyri is in a sense the, just the continuation of a much older phenomenon of finding papyri in Egypt, you know, Greek papyri, Roman papyri, Latin, Hebrew, Aramaic, and so forth. But um, quantity-wise, before Arabic papyri, there is uh, Greek and Coptic uh, dominate, and Arabic uh, up starts appearing either with the Muslim conquest or a bit before, and uh, paper is introduced around the 9th century. I'm, I'm kind of trying to do it quickly, so I hope it's all clear. You know this. I don't need to explain what is the Cairo Geniza, uh, so we can skip that. Um, and, but here I am actually talking only about the Ben Ezra synagogue, Geniza, because that's where you find women's letters. I don't think there is a single woman letter that I know of in the Fyrkovich collection, although I will mention one Fyrkovich uh, document. Uh, and the reason why, um, without talking about the Geniza, the one thing that is important to know is, of course, everybody knows it's not an archive, which means that by definition, the Geniza can be considered a single find within the framework of papyrology. The question why it's not the case is the history of the field, I think. Uh, but we'll talk about it in a second. OK, we are just one reason is, of course, the amount of numbers. So when we talk about Arabic papyri, we're talking about 150,000 items. That's the last estimation. In the Geniza, the last estimation is almost 300,000. So you know, a single find that is actually twice as large as all the finds together. Um, one of the differences, and again, this is the question. I mean, are we doing a comparison, or are they complementary? The Arabic papyri are mostly documentary. The Cairo Geniza is mostly literary. Uh, Arabic papyri is found, this has to do with the fact that, obviously, you know, uh, Egypt is the gift of the Nile. Well, papyri is the anti-gift of the Nile, <laughs> or, or whatever you want. The, the Nile is the curse of the papyri, right? Wherever there is water, there is no found papyrus, so it's always found in the edge of the desert, in villages, in the Fayyub, or so forth. So it's mostly outside of the delta, and of course, that's why you get the papyri, and you'll see examples of much more rural, much more uh, focused on the rhythm of the Nile. It's really sort of present, when you, at least when you read the sort of Arabic papyri. Uh, with the Cairo Geniza, the Nile is mentioned. Of course, people go up the Nile, down the Nile. I don't get the sense that there is a very strong presence of the rhythm of the Nile, you definitely get the sense of the rhythm of the Mediterranean, which of course means why, and it's of course very urban, very delta, uh, Jewish. One of the big questions is why the Geniza has so little on Christians, uh, you know, which are still the majority in Egypt at this time. Uh, I'll switch all this. I... But the big difference is 
that the Arabic papyri contains many different finds of widespread and often unknown locations at different periods from the 7th century onward, while the Cairo is a single find of cohesive community, uh, from, you know, which is why Goitan was able to write. And now if we are moving to the sort of histories of the field, um, a Mediterranean society. Uh, so as I said, Arabic papyri is part of papyrology, although for a long time it was kind of like a, a neglected stepchild. Things are changing these days. Um, while the Cairo Geniza was placed by Schechter, its discoverer, you know, straight in the middle of Jewish studies. Um, and here it's a bit, you know, it's easier to go from Goitan and the Mediterranean society who did actually use papyri in the first sort of pages of a Mediterranean society. If you look at the notes, he mentions a lot Greek papyri. He, he sort of conceived of his project in relationship with Arabic papyri. But Arabic papyri didn't have a goitain. First of all, it's not clear at all that a synthesis such as goitain can be made. And the other problem is, and here I'm going into risky territory, but uh, you'll forgive me, the figure of Goman, Adolf Goman, the sort of central figure of Arabic papyri, uh, who was a Nazi in some way or another. I mean, uh, this has been researched. I mean, he, he benefited from the uh, uh, Germans' conquest of Czechoslovakia. He, he was involved in the transfer of Jewish library, maybe. Uh, and at least in one case, he may have signed sort of the death warrant for at least one sort of Jewish scholar who, they are, whatever. So basically, after the war, kind of nobody really wanted to work with him. He was a, a problematic figure, which means that while the sort of Cairo Geniza field of documentary studies is well known for having Isnads, I am the student of X who was a student of Goitain, and we kind of compare Isnads and uh, so forth, Arabic papyri has tended not to have these, uh, you know, you have important figures, Jeffrey Kahn, um, Rarib, um, Rarib um, Deem, and so forth, but only in the past 10 years, or past 15 years, there have been a sort of a revival and you can say a more, a, a community of Cairo Guineas, of uh, Arabic papyri. Okay, all this was just to get you on to the same, to the thing. Uh, okay. Okay, so when I move now to women's letters, I, uh, I cannot really use a lot of the literature on Arabic papyri because these questions have not really been asked in that field of Arabic papyri. I'll use uh, it in a bit uh, later. Uh, the question about can we hear women's voices? And I think the approach of Goitain uh, in the very beginning of his, um, it, it's, it's that the sheer joy of discovery. You know, the fact that we do have letters composed by women. We'll talk about what this composed mean. But we have these letters. And his approach is what I sort of call optimistic and impressionistic. And I don't mean by this negative. I have great respect for <laughs> Goitain. Uh, but, you know, he says things that we hear the female voice guiding the male pen. Uh, the female voice was heard directly and emphatically. Uh, so this is the optimistic. The impressionistic is that we don't get a sense of, you know, we hear. I, I'd like to know how you hear. You know, what does it mean that we hear it? Uh, it's, it's very hard to, uh, you know, if I still have the scientific mindset, replicate, you know, you know sort of understand what he means by this. Uh, the other important figure that is written in on women's uh, letter is Joel Kramer, in a, especially in a very important article, Women Speak for Themselves. He had a plan to um, collect and publish all of the women's letters in the Geniza. He probably won't do it, and he passed it on uh, to René Levin Melamed. And I also say that a lot of my thinking on women's letters uh, in the past year or so has been done you know, with René in our sort of chevruta of reading women's letters. Uh, and Kramer, I think, adopts Goitain's optimistic and sometimes impressionistic. And he's also sometimes impressionistic. You know, this letter was di dictated to a scribe, but the mother's speech is clearly conveyed. And I'm like, what's clearly? Uh, you know, you might say, oh, that there is no problem here, and then I'll just move on. But if are you uh, a woman or a woman's voice could be heard in public? And he says this about petitions. You know, the one sort of genre that is probably the most problematic. It's the most formulaic. It's you know, all the women are. Naked, starving, sick, uh, sick, and uh, lonely. You know. So, but he still says that it's a woman's voice. And here is my own sort of admission. Uh, my advisor 
all, not writing about women, but writing on, um, on, letter, on the poor letters in the Geniza, also uses that language of the voice of the poor. Okay. Now, it's harder for me to sort of uh, portray the um, criticism. Oops, I lost. Uh, against this optimistic and impressionistic thing because nobody has really sort of put it down on paper. But I can try. Okay. Sorry, just, just before then, I'll say that uh, Kramer does, in um, w at least in two points, does give us, it goes beyond the impressionistic in telling us, and I hide it in yellow so I wouldn't need to, you know, what for him, I think, is the sort of um, smoking gun or the sort of what, what is reflecting of the voice. So he says the documents embody the word of women, embedded in the actual paper written in the very ink that they or their scribe <laughs> used. This direct, unmediated writing is priceless for the culture of the story. The writing is spontaneous and unaffected. I didn't mark this because I don't, it's hard for me to measure. Abounding in colloquialism, misspelling, slips of the pen, and corrections. Socially inferior as they were, their mode of address is informal and unceremonious, and letters to them may also be in lower speech register. So what I marked in yellow are, for me, going a bit beyond the sort of impression to sort of say, okay, these are the tools. I'm, I'm, basically what I'm trying to do is, can we figure out tools to give uh, in order to f sort of reach uh, to women voices? And I'll challenge that, those assumptions in a second. Female literacy was a blessing in disguise, at least for the historian and to the sociolinguist, for when an uneducated woman dictated a letter to a son, daughter, brother, husband, friend, or young child, her word underwent only minor textual processing, and the document is close to natural speech. Okay, so now going uh, forward, as I said, um, I think it's pretty easy to attack this if I want to. Um, the, the issue is that when we are dealing with Middle Arabic, um, a lot of these things are taken for granted, are, you know, just simply how uh, these things. Colloquialism, misspelling, slips of the pen and corrections, that is just as much what the scribe can do. I mean, these are not professional scribes. That's one thing. The other thing they're writing in Middle Arabic in which, you know, I don't know how to do this, how to know that this colloquialism is a woman's speech versus a scribe writing the way he writes or the way he thinks a letter should be. Um, the other thing is that when you talk about lower speech register and so forth, I'm not a linguist, but it's also extremely difficult to account for class and age. You know, is this letter you know, using a lower speech register because it's written by a woman or because the scribe was a, her child or is because it was a poor man the scribe was, so he was not unprofessional? I don't know how to do it. Um, so that's one type of criticism. The other type of criticism, and this was raised by uh, Miriam Frankel in a review of Mark Cohen's book, is that at least when it comes to the petition of the letters of the poor, we know that these poor people were writing for the voice to the ears of the rich and wealthy people. So they are writing, you know, what would work and not, um, you know, what they want necessarily to say. Uh, so, questions, comments? Not yet. Okay, if, uh, sorry. I guess if, um, you know, let, let's say then we start with the opposite possibility, right? Mm -hmm. These are simply male writings. Can we ascertain that any more than this? I mean, That's actually why I also raised the issue of the poor letters, because sometimes you can say, oh, why are you asking this about women? Men also use scribes. You know, why? Well, the fact that we usually ask this about women uh, may reflect our own assumptions more, more than uh, that. So the, the fact that it's also been raised on male letters, I think, is, is, is in a sense a good defense. Okay, this also has been, you see what I mean? But you're right. Probably like letters that start, I am a blind woman, I am a blind man. man. Or, or also, yeah, I mean, and we also know that many men use scribes or, or people who wrote for them. You're completely right. Um, and just to sort of, as, as a sort of a critique of the, criti uh, of the uh, critique, the, one of the assumptions here are that all these letters are written by, women, uh, by men for women, that there is no 
woman writer. So far in the Geniza, as far as I know, nobody has been able to prove that a letter was written by a woman. But this in Arabic papyri, I was pleasantly surprised to know that there is actually a letter that, for as, as best we know, was written by a woman. It's a letter from a woman to her sister. And usually in these letters, when a scribe is used, you'll see a few examples of it uh, later. In the end, the scribes add uh, his own greetings. You know, the scribe kind of says, oh, yeah, I'm the scribe. Um, I also send greeting. Please do this, that, and so forth. And you have in this letter, you know, El Katiba Takra Alaikum as Salam. Yeah. So at least here, and the point is not the fact that we have, okay, one letter written by a woman. So what? The issue is that when I look at this, I can't say that this was a letter written by a woman. At least, in, and I, I want to, like the handwriting. I mean, I'm not a great uh, expert on paleo, but it doesn't look like anything different than a male hand. And people have argued that, oh, this letter is a woman's letter because it's written unprofessionally. No, uh, what I'm saying is that these are, assumptions, these are more assumptions, I think, than um, straightforward. Okay. So, yeah, the difference is, is that at least in the Jewish world, and this is kind of like you need in order to all this thing, there is some sort of assumptions or some sort of background, and one of the background is that there are no evidence of women scribes, so so we don't have a Paula. <laughs> um, you know, the, the assumption is that women did not participate. Uh, the one example, actually it's a shame that Yalom is not here because one of the examples where there is a document that Goitan says, oh, it, it mentions a Nasikha, you know, like a female uh, copyist. Uh, actually, they read it as Nasikha, you know, a woman who is devout to something. So even that one mention is uh, outside the window. Um, yeah. How, how much do we know? Well, uh, first of all, what do you mean? By, okay, this is, you know, well, what is literacy? Literacy writing or literacy reading? I don't know, but we have this, uh, again, uh, document, uh, letter from the Geniza mm -hmm. to my mom, the, the, to my mom is about this group of girls. Who, yes. So they learn to read or Yeah, write. okay, but they read. It says they learn the prayers. Yeah, the, it says more. Now, some women know how to read. But yeah, my and, yeah, and, and the Melamedet knew how to read uh, the famous uh, Melamedet Tatinokot from Maimonides' responsa. Yeah. Um, and we do, I mean, there's a whole question about a woman's literacy, but as far as we know, I mean, there's also a difference between knowing how to write something and writing something like this, like like a letter, like you know, and the idea. Question. Okay. You moved out of the Beniza to the philology. How uh -huh. about To your assumption. <laughs> no, no I, I mean, and again, actually, what I'm going to go further and say that all this, I think, is wrong because I want to re-examine the issue of dictation. That's kind of where I'm heading uh, thing and, you know, whether dictation is, is really as problematic as people, you know, it's assumption. But, but the issue of literacy, I think, I, I am, uh, in that sense, a minimalist, especially with having to do with Jewish women. I think that writing, you know, the Hebrew script was not something c common for sure not. Uh, there is, you know, I can cite like a, a document, a, a literary text that mentioned that it's okay to teach women writing. But, I mean, my assumptions is goes to the minimalist uh, spectrum simply because we have, it's, it's also not, a, it's a, not an argument out of silence considering we have so many documents 
You know, I mean, it, it's one thing to make a, an argument out of silence when you don't have uh, documents. Where we don't see, uh, we know that women were sent to school, probably so, you know, they know the prayers, uh, maybe so they can read. But writing is, and especially, I mean, uh, it, it's a whole other thing. We, you well, she know, she she had to read. But did she have to write? She, you know, she didn't write any of her documents. That's for sure. Um, she had a very close relationship with the court clerk. Uh, I didn't mean it in any sort of sexual way, although of her <laughs> uh, thing. Um, but uh, I, you know, my, I'm a minimalist when it comes to women's literacy. Uh, I don't think that actually it to women's writing, actual writing, except this. Which changes, the, this is why for me it's so interesting. This for me kind of, uh, I don't know how you say that in English. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll try to move forward to talk about some of the baggage. And I, I, again, I, I use words in a negative that are negative, but I don't mean them in a negative way, please. Um, the, by baggage, I mean what is brought to the table. And part of the question, and why it's kind of been debated and, and people argue about it is because we have all these expectations. You know, a lot of feminist sort of writing was about women's voices. Here are just kind of uh, a few famous sort of uh, or important books that, you know, are all talking about women's voice uh, or, you know, this ability to speak. Uh, the other thing, so that's one type of baggage that we come with. Uh, you know, sometimes I think when you, you uh, sort of examine the expectations, you start sort of uh, realizing that these are different, th you know, that it's more issue of what are you expecting to find than what are you uh, actually finding. The other thing has to do with our expectations about letters. And this, I am actually, I, I think it's a, we sometimes think of letters as, uh, you know, post-romantic letter writing, especially where especially women were trained to pour their soul into the page, that letter writing was about soul searching. Uh, and these assumptions are with us. You can see that in the literature. Uh, but of course, when you're looking at documentary letters, uh, and again, these are not sort of Abelard and Louis, you know, Heloise and all that. I mean, these are um, letters written from X to Y to convey a, a certain communication. Uh, it's not about soul searching. It's not about the interiority of the self. It's about... Um, you know, getting things done. So when you have like an Arabic uh, papyri like this, or Arabic uh, papyrus like this, you know, where Um al Hakam uh, sends to the person who is probably a male agent, I have sent you a request to buy. Sorry, I also I didn't prepare a handout because I thought I shouldn't bother you with a whole bunch of text. Uh, what I did is, when I could, I just put on the sort of handout some of the original text just so you could see them. Here I didn't have space. Uh, and I did this this morning, I'm sorry. I have sent you a request uh, to buy for us three dirhams of all of I'm just giving this an example of what are the type of things that you actually find in these letters. Uh, you know, you find three dirhams of, uh, dirham here is a um, amount of weight. Uh, sorry, here it's actually money. And dirham of onion, but I don't know if it finished with that or not. If you have with you winter grapes, send some of me. If you have with you a surplus of wheat, lend me some uh, three uh, dabs, uh, dabs of wheat or barley. I mean, if you, have all, if you come with all the expectations of discovering women's voices, here are the only, you know, except uh, the famous Kamuna and the wife of Dunash, uh, you know, uh, this is not Jewish, but uh, if you come up with those expectations, you're going to be very much disappointed uh, in these letters. And I think some of the issues are this kind of like, okay, so is this a woman's voice? Okay, uh, I'll move on because I think you might not be buying the problematics, uh, but you're polite. I, I don't know if you're saying, I'm checking the time to see if I, was that a question? No. Okay. Me neither, but again, I'm a minimalist. <laughs> No, pleasure. Yeah, it's great. I, I just, 
again, there is the question of the parallel about Muslim women. They, it yeah. is, you are speaking, you are speaking as a minimalist in terms of number. I'm totally with you. Mm -hmm. But at least I'm told that among Muslim women, you occasionally have this girl who got this special education. Why assume that none, no such girl existed among you? I, for me, it's not an assumption as much as an issue of genre. I mean, I just think that these sort of uh, kind of uh, poetry of call and response, I don't know, you're, you're the, uh, you know, you don't need to be, uh, uh, you don't need to have a male and a woman in order to write letters. I mean, sure, we have these sort of exchange of poetry, but you also have the sort of phenomena of people writing, you know, the two sort of points of views. But, the, but, but, the, but again, and again, the social, science, the social historian kind of steps forward and, and says, but these women that exist in, yeah, do we have women in that sort of social, I mean, you know, a lot of them are singing girls, they're slaves. You, you need to also, the fact that they are women, that, you know, you need to sort of see whether these are really the same phenomena existing socially in Jewish society. I do remember, though, a uh, Geniza document in which somebody asked to buy a singing slave. That was the only one. Usually when you talk about uh, slavery in the Geniza, it's female and domestic slavery, not all that. Okay, uh, maybe I'll, I'll sort of convince you that there is a problematics, is that, uh, so in one of these sort of answers that you can say to the criticism against you know, the voice of the poor, as I said, you know, they are writing to the ears of the rich uh, and wealthy folks. Well, that's what letters are. Letters are X writing with a message to Y. Of course, I mean, this is, it's not the voice of the poor if you expect some sort of subaltern uh, Marxist uh, statement, which I know of too, uh, of uh, poor people, you know, kind of the sort of uh, domination and resistance, that book, you know. Um, but if you're talking about, you know, they are the voices of what poor people want. They want the wealthy people to give them money. So in, in that sense, it is their uh, voices. But uh, I don't, um, okay, I'm going to skip this and move on to dictation. Just the one point, and you might say, okay, oh yeah, <laughs> there's, is one point is, first of all, the dictation is not hidden. You know, I'm, basically what I'm trying to do here is naturalizing dictation. Dictation is writing. And the fact that these women are using scribes, well, it's not just that men also use scribes, is that dictation was a form of writing in the medieval Islamic world, as you probably all know more than me. I mean, many books were written by dictation. And so, for example, it, it's not, first of all, when you get a letter like this, probably most people in the sort of 12th century Jewish uh, world of Fustat immediately knew who penned this. The same way that we know who penned this, this is Khalfon ben Menashe handwriting. Uh, but this is a letter from his wife to her brother. And at the end, you know, he just adds, as I said, usually the scribe adds that sort of thing. You know, you're a slave, Abu Sa'id ben al-Khataif uh, misses you and so forth. And then he gives him some news at the top. My point is that mediation, and this is kind of the Geertz argument, um, you know, we can understand other societies not by trying to bypass all the various mediations that exist, if it's mediation of time or, or informants or so forth, but we need to work through them. We need to understand, you know, the sort of logics of these mediations. So let's look about uh, this type of mediation, which is the dictation. Um, the other point is that uh, letters by women talk about writing letters as writing. <laughs> so, for example, in this letter, I have not received news from Salem up to now. Uh, this is a, a letter of a woman to her sister. I have written letters to Balad al uh, when the cantor, the son of Muammar bin uh, al Ghazafini. I have a whole argument about this name. If you want, you can take it or not. Uh, our relative came. By the way, we know probably who this son of al Muammar is, and I know his handwriting from other letters. And it's very similar to this. So it's probably also him writing this letter. 
uh, our letter, I instructed him to write beautiful and illustrious, if you want to read that word as uh, Majid, um, no, Majida, uh, letters to Beladarum. Asking about, <coughs> my point here is simply that she talks about writing letters with this El Ghazafini, El Ghaza, uh, how did I say, Ghazafini, um, as writing. So women themselves, I mean, this is kind of something that has been done a lot in the history of emotions. Uh, you know, in the history of emotions, there is debate about whether are we, re when we read about a person being angry, are we really, you know, reading about interiority or are we reading about expression? You know, kind of like uh, exteriority. And one of the approaches, and I think it's a good approach, um, is to say, well, if the society itself doesn't question its own uh, emotions, the, the sincerity of those emotions, we shouldn't do that either. So the fact that these women describe what they're doing as, you know, I wrote, even though they're dictated, for me is, I think, a reason to move forward. <sighs> you know, I think I can... Part of what I'm trying to do here is also, I mean, part of what I wanted to do here is actually look at the nuts and bolts, you know, how dictation worked. And here is just an example where a woman is, is, is saying to this other woman, you know, I'm writing you, uh, but when you write, please write me. But when you write, send your letter to the person who gave you this letter, for he knows us, and he will send it to us with someone he knows. And then, you know, he'll come back to you and pass through you, so write it with him. If you want, he'll write for you or read for you. Uh, so ask him to do so, for I have commanded him to do so, and he's a good uh, servant of God. What I'm saying is that dictation was not a problematic issue. They were very much aware, and they were often finding ways of, of you know, arranging um, somebody to either read or write uh, for these letters. Uh, this is it's a great letter. Uh, <laughs> this is actually just to show the other way around, that the people who are receiving letters consider the messages that they receive to be authentic. And this is, I just, it's too good not to. This is a, a person, he had a fight with his father, he probably said some terrible things there, and now he's apologizing on the other side of the page. He says, I became worried when I read your letter as it did not mention my mother. Oh, my father, you did not even inform me whether she is alive. How is it that you're sending me a letter and she is not sending news, as is her custom when she is alive? If my mother died and you did not inform me of this, God is between you and me. If she is alive, then inform me of it for the special connection between me and her. And you can imagine why I'm very much interested in this uh, letter, being a good Jewish boy, although he's a Muslim. Uh, okay. I have a sense that you're... Okay, I'll just move forward because I think, I don't know if I've convinced you or not. Um, the other issue is, of course, that you often have an afterlife of documents. So in this case, a woman uh, has used another man to write for her a letter. And later, the judge sort of then brought her husband with the, uh, with the woman and confronted them. And, you know, there was a legal process. Obviously, if she completely fabricated her tale, it would have been now discovered. Okay, one, uh, kind of going back to my criticism of Kramer about lang uh, language register and uh, use of uh, uh, corrections or mistakes uh, in the text, I do think that there is one element which I actually do think that can be used as a tool uh, about dictation, and I'm not inventing this. This has been done actually quite a lot with Greek papyri which is a uh, use of repetition. Um, when, as you can hear from my own talk, I repeat myself. <laughs> we tend to be more repetitive when we speak than when we write. Now, of course, you can say, well, if repetition is then a social convention, then a scribe would know uh, to write repetition. But, you know, I think it at least passes the bar uh, towards the other person. This is a very nice letter uh, by a woman to her, uh, I think it's a niece. Yeah, and probably a niece and probably also a daughter-in-law. And, you know, she just, and she, she is living in Damascus. She wants this daughter to move to, uh, to Fust uh, from Fustat to Damascus. And she's doing everything she can to convince her to come. So, you know, the greatest of my love to you and your place in my heart. Uh, you know, anyway, I just highlighted the, my place in the heart to just kind of see just how I think repetition can be used to maybe imagine the situation of oral dictation. Uh, and maybe this does sort of, con uh, sort of come back 
to you know what the the, the person who was dictating uh, actually did. Um, I cannot uh, avoid just also having this. You're saying in the letter, oh, sorry, this is just too much, too much fun to read, not to read. Know that Damascus is known among all cities for its great goodness, or maybe wealth, and for having good and kosher Jews. If you come, you will be happy and obtain what you want. I have a suspicion that this daughter-in-law uh, was widowed from the sort of uh, son of the, um, it's not just my suspicion, this is, I think, the accepted reading. And now she's basically saying, come to Damascus and you'll find a good uh, kosher Jew to marry. If you come, you'll be happy and obtain what you want, and I will obtain through you what I want. Even less from this ought to convince those of sound mind, especially a smart woman. I, I like actually to translate a bit loosely, I, but I think it's, it makes sense when writing, when translating letters, that which you, uh, again, place of my heart. Okay. Again, this is me trying to convince you that dictation is uh, Basically that it's, you know, court documents are often written in the sense of, okay, we know actually this. We see the court clerks, they do these summaries of what happened, and then they go home and a few months later, they, or two weeks, a few weeks later, they submit the finished product. Uh, I know this is completely ahistorical, and this is actually a man, I, I don't want this to be mistaken, and it's actually from El Hariri in a case where um, a person wrote a very successful petition, and he's asking, this is not the writing of the petition, it's the writing of a copy of a successful petition. Basically, the petition was so successful that the person got rich. So now um, he wants to have that sort of petition, a copy of it. But, you know, looking at a picture from Morocco about dictation, uh, this is a drawing from um, Cairo uh, from the 19th century. There is, I don't know, maybe I'm here insulting all historians ever, there is a sort of... a long dure tradition of dictation, of writing letters and petitions. And I think in all of them, you see that there is a sort of a relationship between the scribe and the person that is intimate. I especially like this one because she's obviously reading what he's writing and making sure. Obviously, I don't know. But it looks like she's looking at what he's writing and checking. Anyway, this was kind of like an exercise. Not as anachronistic, but I think it's, it's helpful to imagine. Now I'm going to give two examples that go against my argument. And this is the sort of example for Firgovic. It's probably the most interesting, I think, for me. Legal document from the Geniza about marital problems. Uh, I can't go into the, all the case, but basically a woman from the Karait community was observed with a, a man visiting her. She was married, but a man kept uh, visiting her. Uh, and there, you know, there's evil rumors about it. They multiplied for several years. And finally, somebody had enough. And a petition about this was written to the writer of these li uh, lines and was thrown to his dwelling. So somebody basically wrote a, I don't know how to pronounce it, Pashkvil, <laughs> and threw it to the house of the local uh, communal leader. He had now, because it now became public knowledge, he had to approach the Karaite Nasi. The there is a whole sort of legal process, really interesting. I don't know why it was not published. Um, but then we reached the point where she was asked about this petition, whether she knows who wrote it or not. And she said that she knows who wrote it and that she was behind the tasababat, uh, its writing. He who wrote it did not write what she heard from her exactly, but added and subtracted. This, as far as I know, the most you know, direct evidence for how the writing of petitions actually took place. Although, and this is kind of where the literary reading goes, this could also be a form where dictation and mediation actually was a certain advantage to women. It was always a way to say, oh, I don't know. He wrote whatever he wanted. I, I, I don't know why he wrote. He added and subtracted. So there's also that possibility, and I'm not denying it, that this is a form of defense. But as far as I know, you know, what I'm trying to do here is also just kind of move from the question of, you know, is there women voices to you know, actually show the evidence. So this is the type of evidence that we have. And this is from an Arabic papyri actually between men, but it's just such a wonderful thing. I've written to Abu Abdallah al Talhi, uh, and I have questioned him about this frequent absence from the estate. I think he has handed over his letter to somebody who does not know how to read well, so that he has read to him what I never wrote, <laughs> what I have never written. For he wrote to me two letters, none of which contain any answer to what he. Again, this could also have been a defense mechanism, you know, sort of like, oh, I'm going to answer something completely different. I'm going to use 
the problematics of communications, the fact that communication was not uh, certain. But I think these two examples, in a sense, question, you know, this is why I brought it as a sort of workshop. I'm giving examples of all sides to show that there was awareness of the problematics of the whole sort of system of correspondence, that things are not transparent. Okay. Um, okay, this is, I'm actually, I think, when do we say that we need to finish? We have half an hour. Okay, so, but continue quest, I mean, I think this is more helpful. Then. I'm going to switch now I, um, to actually discuss the other issue of, is there something that distinguishes women's letters? And now I want to use, if before I use Joel Kramer and the sort of, uh, uh, Geniza sort of literature about women's letter. Now I'm going to use at least the one statement I know from a, paper, a paperologist, uh, Werner Diem, who sort of describes in an article the sort of Arabic letters, and he says a few things about women's letter that are sort of distinctive. One, that women's letters, uh, men write about anything. Women usually write about domestic issues. Uh, women mention other women. So there is like a sort of a, a homo world of men who mention other men. Women, they mention other women. And uh, women letters are more emotional. I'm not going to argue against it because you know, I'm not an expert in Arabic papyrology, and he is the expert. <coughs> I will raise an issue that I know very well from the Geniza, which is I actually don't think that gender here is the, is the u most useful category. Because again, letters are X sending a message to Y. And so you have to think both about X and Y. It's not just women's letter. It's who is writing to whom. So relationship is much more important than gender. Um, so my point is that a letter from uh, a sister to a brother is completely different than a letter from a wife to a husband. Uh, this has to do with age. This has to do with relationships. Uh, so, and just to give you an example, this is a nice drawing that I had. Uh, it's a, a nice letter uh, by... Uh, a man writing to his cousin, she probably got divorced and got a large sum of money, which is rare. And now he wants her to come to Palestine and perform the pilgrimage. And on the way, I think he wants to marry her. You'll see why in a second. Um, and uh, it's a nice letter, but what I'm actually more concerned about is this part. But just so you get why I like this letter, you know, he's basically telling her, do everything you can. Uh, just come to Palestine. It's great will sort of look at all the holy places and so forth. Use any means necessary to come and do not delay. Only the Creator knows the loneliness in which I am. Here a man is quite emotional. I, I actually don't believe that men are, more emotion, are less emotional than men. I think that men write more mercantile letters in which emotions take a less role unless you are angry about another merchant. So, yeah. Anyway, you and I will enjoy each other's company and God, until God decree. I just could not put... I mean, until God decree our faith... Uh, in the land of Israel, he who granted us to live in it will also grant us to be buried in it. I will divide my livelihood between you and you and me for what remains of life. For me, is not like what passed. Basically, I'm past uh, the middle. And then, you know, this is a man's uh, writer to a cousin, and he has no problem of going, Congratu oh, sorry. Congratulate Sit El, Sit El is an, a female name. Uh, for me, for her newborn, and greet everyone for me. Greet for me also the household of Saeed El Kol, the, eh, the old and young, and Um Bakia. Ask her, uh, is the robe that I sent with her, uh, you know, this is completely domestic, completely within a world of women, although the writer is a man. I mean, it's just because of the relationship. When a cousin who also wants to marry this woman uh, is writing to a female, it's not a man's letter. It's a letter of a cousin. And so it's going to talk about thing. And there is also, this is an example from, uh, sorry, um, as, uh, from a, papyra, a papyrus, again, the shearing is finished. You won't get this in any Geniza document. I can guarantee it. It's just it's, it's a completely rural uh, setting, uh, and she cares about uh, the dinar, you know, and she's much more involved. This woman in the sort of finances of the house than you find in any wife in the Geniza. Uh, I took to, uh, you know, and then. Also, you left me with the hired builders who sit in the house. They say you have not left. It's just a very different setting. Um, I'm just using these, not so much to say, okay, Deem gave us generalizations,
but I'm giving you the exceptions. I'm saying that relationship here count much more. Okay, this was kind of like my correction, I think, to talking about women's letter or gender. Now I am actually going to argue for one, and Rene will forgive me because she heard part of it, but not the final part, um, about what I do think is, defend is uh, distinguishable about women's letter, and it's about loneliness. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll uh, spill the beans. Basically, in this world in which social capital is much more important, uh, okay, sorry, that women had much less forms of cultural capital than men. They practically had very little forms of cultural capital because I'm a minimalist. Um, social capital became much greater importance. And also, you cannot gain social capital except through marital or family ties. You know, you don't go to school and you know are with other men. You don't have a coalition of merchants and so forth. So, the concern of social ties is uh, extremely important for women. I can talk about how social ties are worked in the court um, and so forth. So, when you look at petitions, loneliness much more than men. Uh, petitions is, uh, and I'll show you one example with a man just as a sort of comparison. Okay, so this is just um, to sort of put you in the world of loneliness. Your poor, wretched, woeful, mournful, worried, and afflicted, the Hebrew is here, it's just nice, oh, terrible. Uh, servant, cast my entity before you to hear the words of your servant. For many are my sighs and my heart is sick. I'm alone. I have neither a husband nor son nor daughter nor brother nor sister. I wander like the lone bird on a roof. And I can just give you more and more petitions of women who talk about their loneliness. Uh, a lot of it is expressed through inkita, which is a whole other word, uh, issue that I, uh, basically this is, I argue, <coughs> means uh, being without social connections. It has been understood, Monkatia is all sorts of things. It was understood as uh, single women. It was understood as women who stay at home and don't go out due to modesty. Uh, I, I'm not gonna go into the philological sort of proof that it means a woman without connections, but these examples show it. Your slave in for the glory of the Gionate, of her state, and that of her children, of their starvation, nakedness, and being banished from their home for three months. She's cut off from Munkatia from you. Here, the Inkita is not simply the meaning of I'm cut off. I, I, I don't have somebody. Um, she has no one to, you know, I'm cut off from you. She has no one to speak on her behalf. So this is the Inkita. Uh, your slave's brother are not able to show themselves in public. So Inkita is something to do with uh, even temporary. You know, temporarily her brothers are... Uh, not able to help her, so she's Munkatia. Um, I'm a Munkatia woman, again, a woman without social, uh, the sort of, at the moment she's without effective social ties. I do not have anywhere to turn to except God's gate and yours. I got stuck with a man, a bad man. This is obviously a show that it's not meaning a uh, single woman. My father does not provide for me, her brother. Again, I'm not saying that men are not lonely. It's just that in any way you cut the evidence, women use it much more. Uh, okay, and I, I'm going to skip this part. I'm just going to say that at least in literary sources as well, we see this as association of women without social connections. Uh, this is Ibn Asayaf. He, he writes a, a bureaucratic manual. Uh, and in the chapter on Madalim, he says, for most of those seeking Madalim justice, what does that mean? Uh, are the weak, the destitute, and munkatiat women. Okay, so this, in a sense, also shows the gendered part. And... What is so beautiful for me, or so, what I, I mean, I'm not enjoying people suffering, but I enjoy the, is that you don't have to be lonely in order to be lonely. This is a letter of a woman, and she says, my brother, where are you to see me after your and my mother's departure? How I remain by myself and alone. For my brother Joseph married in El Jibal and had two boys, he's well and healthy, Mubashir uh, married in Palermo uh, this year, blah, blah, blah. I remained alone. We miss you. I, my husband, my boys, Dikri Farah, Barakat, and so forth. Okay? We're alone together. We're alone. <laughs> She's very lonely together with her uh, husband and so forth. Because loneliness is about, first of all, it's a communication, right? I mean, it's an expression of a message that I want to convey to you. And it's also about, you know, the ties of blood are more important than the ties of marriage. You know, writ large. <laughs> okay. Um, the other point is uh, that... Basically, I'll skip these to get to the final example, but these are all examples that, sh that not only m women use loneliness more than men, but they use it in gendered expressions. So, I have no one to buy and sell for us. 
you strive for men and those with power, I would like you to strive for me. Okay? Uh, or uh, you know how much men struggle these days to make ends meet, how much more so are those behind the veil? Here you could say men is just general for everybody. No, those behind the veil, I think, um, who do not know their right from left. Again, this is language of uh, weakness, of disempowerment, because that sort of requires the person to respond. Uh, this is just, I wanted to give an example in Hebrew. How much more difficult is the situation of she who is hidden in the belly of the earth and is uh, dependent on all chavuya bevetena adama v'tzricha l'akol. Or when a man says it, is I'm hiding from predators at home like the women. So this issue of women and loneliness, I think I've proven. I'm using now, as a final sort of demonstration, two petitions, uh, which I like a lot because they um, have a lot in common. They are both a petition written at the same time, one is by a woman to Abraham Maimonides, probably. The other is uh, by a man to Abraham Maimonides' father-in-law. Um, both say, please give me money because I want to enjoy the benefaction, the, you know, the holiness of the synagogue. And here, Baruch and Kadosh. So there's, you know, but the parallel end there. So this is a woman who lives in a small upper apartment. She actually doesn't use the word munkatia. I don't know even if you use the word alone, but the sense of loneliness kind of passes through. Uh, she lives in a small upper apartment of a ruin, disheveled by age. It has no closet, no vestibule, no solar. No, uh, she has no love for it. She, I, she, I don't want to stay in this ruin. But when she sits in her house and she hears the Kadosh Baruch and Kaddish of the cantor says in the synagogue, you know, she, she, sorry, she hears it. The house is next to the house of Rabbi Elijah, the judge, and, and he knows it. He doesn't know her. She doesn't say it. She's, it's very obvious from the context. She knows the house. She doesn't want to say that I have a connection to this judge. I am a widow. I have no one but my boy who leaves in the morning. So she has a boy, but she doesn't use the boy as to say, okay, I have a social relationship. I have somebody to take care of me. She actually uses it to demonstrate how much she's alone because he, does, he leaves in the morning and doesn't come back in the evening. Um, okay. The man's letter is a completely other world. Again, he, he, they share the same sort of themes. But what I would argue is that every sentence here speaks the language of belonging, the language of male sort of bonding. I am from a well-to-do family, one. And my father was one of the India travelers, two. God has bestowed upon me us his grace and made us prosperous. My Lord, your father is acquainted with my father and my brother Futuh. And then his brother traveled to India, eh, to Yemen. He died there. Um, but before he, lay, he left, the brother uh, sort of uh, bequeathed some of his possession to his brother, some, let, you know, lest something happen to me. But, um, but he said, uh, okay, uh, but the document was not written according to the legal procedure because the two of us were in a wine party. I mean, he, I mean, he actually is, uh, you know, damaging his legal position. But still, it, you know, it's the wine party, the sort of social you know, thing. I, your servant, went up to his excellency, you know, and I asked God and you to give me a robe in which I can enter the synagogue. So that woman was sitting alone in the house, asking for help with the rent, uh, so she can enjoy the blessing of the synagogue through oral, you know, that I can hear the prayers going into the wind, you know, through the window. This man wants to go to the synagogue with a robe in which he will feel comfortable. And everybody could watch him and he can participate in the prayer. And where I'm going with this is kind of like where I would like to go one day and write a history of masculinity and at least one, uh, according to, you know, kind of Geniza documents and so forth. And the way I'm thinking about it now is that um, at least the literature on masculinity in medieval Europe often stresses domination. You know, in the knights who sort of in the tournament, in the sort of university debate, in the, uh, in the uh, workshop, you know, the master and disciple. But in the Geniza, I'm finding at least a masculinity of belonging, whether it's to the, uh, there is of course domination, a father writing to his son and stuff like this, but uh, either belonging to the coalition of merchants, either, you know, this kind of uh, belonging, um, and I think it's a sort of middle class, uh, we talked about this. But anyway, this is kind of where I'm going. And I do think that this issue of loneliness and belonging 
is actually a feature that, dis that you know, distinguishes. And I'm a social historian. I'm talking about percentages. I'm not saying, you know, in any sort of big sort of, uh, you know, kind of black and white picture. But the tendency is for loneliness to dominate women's litter and so forth. Thank you. Questions? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, I'll need to look over it. But I, you know, in my mind, I now jump, of course, all the women's petition that do mention the history. And when it comes to legal issues, often you do mention uh, the background, the history. Uh, but you are right, and I'll say in one thing is that this, and this is kind of what my advisor uh, discussed a lot. The theme of "I was once wealthy, and now I'm poor, so help me" is very common in men's letters. And I do not see it so much uh, in women's letters. Uh, so in that sense, yes, that, that, that I, I would agree. But sometimes if you are petitioning against something that is a legal dispute, then you do need to bring the history. Sometimes you can say, okay, I'm not going to tell the whole story. But, but to what extent would you say, like, this loneliness and, in this sense, the kind of embeddedness in the social world um, are the top oil um, of, uh, to what extent are they Uh, it's, it's very difficult, especially with a case of that lonely woman who is not lonely. I mean, it's not a topoi. I mean, or maybe it, it's very hard to put, uh, uh, you know, the finger on it because it might be that this is the social conception. You know, when I started, I thanked the organizers. That was a total topoi, but I also am thanking the organizers. I'm grateful for being here. So, so you know, I, there has been arguments about, you know, we do think in cliches. Uh, so I'm not sure that saying that it's a topoi means that it's not true. Um, but I, my point was also that it is also based a lot about the sort of importance of social ties to women, especially you know when your father dies or when your brother dies. Um, and so I wouldn't just put it as a literary topoi. I mean, it's the, maybe the literary topoi emerges from the reality, which. I don't know. I, mean, I, I think there's kind of a cycle of, <coughs> of those things where the gender of uh, the person being represented in the letter is just being performed in particular ways over and over again. I've, I've been doing this uh, <coughs> kind of disturbing experiment with my iPhone um, where I have a text I want to send and I just write the first word. And then I see whether my next word is among the three that it suggests. Mm -hmm. And I've gone on for about 10 words in some cases uh, only choosing words from the ones that it's suggesting to me and realizing that my, in a sense, my text was written by without, the suggestion. With, with, no, not written by the suggestion. Mm -hmm. Just that the, the sentence that came into my mind was basically so rehearsed and so predetermined mm -hmm. that the computer could do it. Yeah. Um, and then you add a few details uh, here, and, here and there. I mean, I guess, um, you know, whether you're dealing with um, um, uh, a women actually writing letters or um, uh, someone writing a letter for them, mm -hmm. whether they're dictating the content or whether there's a scribe who just knows what should be in the letter. Mm -hmm. The performance of her gender is very, is, is very important mm -hmm. there. Um, the, the loneliness thing, you know, I think it does, it, this is interesting because um, if you look at the literary corpus, mm -hmm. loneliness of men is Right. Uh, is ubiquitous, no, I know. right? It's yes. the occasion of separation. I could actually use that as a... <laughs> right, and so that might be a place where it breaks down. Just a, one, one corpus I'd look at actually would be um, uh, a literary criticism because there are certain yeah. uh, genres that women are supposed to have excelled at, such as Rita, right? Such as mm. um, uh, Lamentation, yeah. precisely because they're allowed to pour out their emotions in a way that a man was supposed to restrain. Um, you might yeah. see some interesting correlations. Yeah. Between the language's performance is often a, a nice trick to avoid that question. 
uh, I don't know if it's a trick. I, I don't mean it again in a it's bad way. It just works either way. But it, so. yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the way, there are, of course, many men who say that they're lonely. Uh, but it's, in, it's just an issue of amount, you know, and, and an issue of, of gendered expressions. Uh, men usually say that they're alone or annoyed when they go to the reef. You know, it's like, I, I need to go to uh, the Fayum now to sort of collect the flax to be sent to the thing, and, and they hate it when they are outside the capital. That's where they start complaining about they loneliness. But it's sort of like Cohen does with uh, you know, the structural poor versus the, uh, what's the word term? Uh, yeah, the uh, congenital. Yeah. I mean, men's loneliness is usually asserted as if I am separated from you so and so at this moment, therefore. Yeah. Although here as well, you had this issue of like, my brothers are hiding because of the taxes. It's, it's a, it could be a temporary thing, this inkita. It's not uh, yeah. No questions? Okay. Thank you very much. And sorry for the late hour. Thank you very much. Dinner is...